hands up at the back if you know who this is yeah it's busby and hi this is lot 76 cars and my name is simon and welcome to the british motor museum for the Vauxhall event hope you enjoy some of the cars we're going to see and the only interviews we're going to have please keep watching so first up we've got a couple of um, Vauxhall Viva Forenza SLs 2.3 litres the non droop snoop car then there's a replica of the DTV now DTV was dealer team Vauxhall a really successfully uh, dealer supported rally program now next up promising um, 120 mile an hour performance and I think 0 to 60 in about seven and a half seconds with just 131 brake horsepower is this Droop Snoot Forenza. Obviously that Droop Snoot that we can see there gave it the improved aerodynamics and to me it makes such a big difference on the car. You know, just in terms of look and some other lovely examples of these cars. I don't know what the total production number is. If I find it, I'll actually stick it in the video but I think they were made in relatively small numbers. Now, like many of the best road going specials of series production cars, these cars were built for rallying, uh, for homologation purposes. So the um, HS Chevette as it is here with the 2.3 engine doesn't seem to get appreciated as much as some of the Escorts. But as you can see here, this is the rally equipped version again. I've got that dealer team Vauxhall logo on there. We'll try and have a look inside that one actually. Yeah, that's uh, well equipped with a roll cage and uh, I think it's got a couple of signatures on there. I'm not sure who's had that. I think these were driven in the day by um, Tony Pond and Russell Brooks and the like. Absolutely fantastic car. With uh, four cylinders, 2.6 litres and 200 brake horsepower, but weighing just over 900 kilos, it's no surprise that this HSR Vauxhall Chevette was used for rally. And in fact, this is one of 30 examples that were built by Vauxhall specifically to homologate their Group B rally project out of 30 cars 28 survive and, and this is one of them so i'm here with uh terry who's chairman of the droop snoot um club um he's going to tell us a bit more about this particular car it's a special car it's a it's one of a small number of cars but actually it, it's pretty special in its own right isn't it yeah this was this is an hsr chevette um it's the rarest what fox will ever produce it was an important car because it was the last car styled at luton it was the last car using a Vauxhall cast engine. Um, it was basically just before they shut Luton. This was what they produced. Wow, that's fantastic! And it's one of I think there's 30 cars built. You said there's there was 30 new cars built on HSs, and then there was a further six cars built on pre-owned HSs because you had to buy an HS to start with, and then had it converted to HSR spec to re-homologate. Um, because there were some anomalies on the homologation which they put right on the HSR. And tell us, the process was that this car was a 5,000 car as an HS, 5,000 pounds car, and then about half as much again to convert it? Yeah, so you bought your 5,400 pounds worth of HS, then you had another 2,000 pound minimum to your dealer to wow. convert it to HSR spec, and then you could actually up-spec that as well. So twin 48 del auto carburetors an exhaust manifold limited slip diff the world was your option there was there was a book full of bits and pieces you could put on it just depended how much money you had wow that's incredible. so this car with the stroker kit as well with the 2.6 um vents and uh, vented discs four pots limited slip diff handling pack all the bits and pieces with this. You'd you could really go to town on equipping these, couldn't you? Yeah, about eleven to twelve thousand pound in nineteen seventy nine. Wow! So that's well over fifty five thousand pounds, and you'd pay in today's money. That is 69. incredible. And you've had the car quite a while, haven't you? I think I've read. I bought it in February eighty eight. And you've it. restored it. It wasn't always in this condition, or you? No, I bought it. I bought it basically in this condition. Um, yes, it's been restored twice. Right. Um, 
once 20 odd years ago when all the body kit came back off again some the dreaded brown stuff had taken yeah. a little bit here and there which does on any 70s car but it gets used this isn't no trailer queen this has done 126,000 miles it's been to switzerland it's been to denmark twice wow. it's been all over europe um yeah, we put all the camping, you know, we dropped the back seat, put all the camping gear in it, drove to Interlagen in Switzerland, had nine days camping. and Absolutely fantastic. Oh, well, smashing. Thank you for telling us more about the car. It's a super no car. Really like it. Thank no you. No problem. So for many years, Vauxhall and Opel were sold together out of the same showrooms in the UK. So it's no surprise that the Manta GTE, this will be one of the later cars, was extremely popular. So this is a 1.8 uh, Berlionetta, so uh, not... Uh, the top of the range GT but nevertheless that's an absolutely lovely colour I think the first owner that had this reckoned he spent more on the car than the purchase price according to the uh, the blurb and we've got wait for it some headlamp wiper action don't we miss headlamp wipers guys and just arrive in an absolutely glorious Opel Monza GSE that just purrs doesn't it now who doesn't like a Vauxhall Cavalier Mark II when most of us were smoking around in 1.6 L sadly this was the one to go for it was the 130 SRI not just the normal SRI but the 130 brake horsepower I mean that sort of level of power output now is is not something particularly that you would shout about but back then the eyes definitely had it and this is a fabulous example of an SRI from I think 87, 88 so uh, not far before the launch of the Mark III car I think. Now what makes this car rare as a Mark II Cavalier is the fact that it's an estate so estates were built in relatively small numbers and for a good reason the panels used to convert or effectively build the estate were sourced from Holden actually in Australia so you can imagine the cost of logistics shipping and then building these uh, in the uh, in the UK um, significantly hampered that really good the loading position on these cars was good because you can see that rear bumper is cut so the, the full section opens up so actually quite a practical and useful car and there's another one here this one's been dropped and lightly customized and uh, it looks lovely as well very nice subtle conversion there still got those that lovely interior that we'd recognize and i'm not sure if that's the original Vauxhall color but it does look very very nice so this aquamarine colored 1.2 merit corsa has had the same family ownership from new and it proudly says it's got no wash wipe no glove box i think no radio this was about as basic as you can come this is your entry ticket to the festival of unexceptional what lovely condition that's in it's a great color isn't it so designed by wayne cherry is this incredibly aerodynamic Vauxhall Calibre. i think it's probably one of the most aerodynamic cars of all time with a cd factor of 0.26 and it shows this particular car is a very very early one it's a 1990 registered car an eight valve car and it's in fantastic order i'm not sure what that Vauxhall color is i'm not up on my Vauxhall colors it's probably something like flame red but what a fantastic car so ahead of its time you know something that's uh, over 30 years old you can see the aerodynamic efficiency of that body and still a very practical car built on the cavalier platform using cavalier mechanicals probably so it's difficult to believe what a massive hit Vauxhall had on their hands with this uh, mark three cavalier when it was launched it was already giving the sierra a very hard time um, this is a k-plated car first cars certainly i remember being on the f plate i had more myself these were the cars to have some new technology in there i think you've got anti-trap electric windows uh, amongst other things and really sold well for them next to it we've got a fantastic corsa and then one of my favorites is this car 
So apologies for the music, got to keep talking to avoid a copyright strike. This is a Vauxhall Viceroy, just 2,200 of these cars were built. You can see that there is a very close relationship with the uh, Carlton in terms of the uh, actual body styling and the look and feel. I think probably um, closer to the Senator as well. I'm not quite sure, I'd have to check that one out. As you can see, it's got that absolutely lovely velour interior. This one's a three-speed automatic car, and uh, it's a great example and a relatively rare example. In fact, the Queen had a uh, not officially produced estate version of one of these. Now, many people of a certain age will remember seeing these on the roads, and maybe, in fact, like this one, learning to drive in them. It is a Vauxhall Viva HC. What a lovely car in the yellow, isn't it? yellow with a black vinyl roof what happened to vinyl roofs they were all the rage weren't they at one time and this car really really suits it doesn't it hands up at the back if you know who this is yeah it's busby and busby's in the front of a bedford ha van in british telecom livery there were thousands of these on the roads absolute thousand let's see if we can try and take a closer so look fully equipped for whatever the telephone engineer of the day needed to yeah. fix your phone you forget about your broadband that wasn't even on the radar then and he's got his ladders on the roof as well glorious so we're celebrating uh, 60 years of the viva what a turnout so I'm with Fred who's going to tell us about this uh, fantastic uh, Brabham uh, Vauxhall, a bit more details about it. Yes. Fred, tell us, this is, this is endorsed by world champion this one, isn't it? It's a Brabham edition car. Yeah, well it was uh, a kit which was put on by the, uh, the dealership when it, you ordered a car, okay. a top spec, HB SL90, which is as, high, as good as you could get right. from the manufacturer. Right and uh, you had the Brabham kit put on at the uh, dealership when the car arrived. Okay, and the difference with the Brabham kit is what? There's obviously well, the stripes, is the obvious one. Well, you say the obvious one. The, the basic Brabham kit, I believe, was a, a twin carb set and a badge on the back. Oh, really? Okay. It's, it's and then there was a list of all the other things you could have up to, to a flowed head and uh, wooden steering wheel. So, uh, so no two cars are probably alike then, are they? Possibly not. No. And how many do you think of these survive, Fred? Good question. <laughs> nobody, nobody really knows. Well, what, there, there is discussion as to what is a real Brabham. Ah, because okay. is it one as you had from the dealership with the the kit put on, or is it? still a genuine Brabham if somebody bought a kit 20 years later which happened to be old, in, old in, new stock or old something. new yeah. stock and there you go so fantastic but probably about 12 I would say about oh okay I've got another one down there look. oh wow you that's fantastic well thank you for talking to us Fred much appreciate it that's all right so this 56 year old beauty is a Vauxhall Viva HA SL90. This particular one's for sale. I am absolutely uh, loving that colour combination, that sort of light blue with the dark blue stripe there. I guess SL was pretty much top of the range. What such period styling from, from 1967, those uh, triple lights this one claims to have been abroad which I'm not sure that it has lovely chrome Vauxhall script yeah I do like that one and even a reversing light and I think reversing lights were even an option back then and this one's got that extra reversing light what a lovely lovely car I like that this is a lovely Bedford HA van, Bedford being the brand that uh, Vauxhall used for its commercial vehicle. This one's in a painter and decorator's livery. Not quite sure what the guy's doing under the front. Let's hope it's just minor repairs and he'll be back on the road soon. He hasn't moved for a while, so I'm getting a bit concerned about him. It's in full painter and decorator mode here. David Jones, painter and decorator, established 1968. It's even got, in the back, 
the radio. That radio's not got quite enough paint on it for me to be a true builder's radio, but that looks great, doesn't it? I like that. So stepping up a level in terms of uh, Viva HC is this Magnum, not the Droop Snoot uh, version, but it's the, it must be near the top of the range. It's got a 2.3 litre petrol engine, engine in a car that size. It must go, if you think that it's had a, a 1300 or 1200 cc engine in the uh, base spec cars, this one must really shift, I would imagine. So, if you like Vivas, you've come to the right place. Viva HAs, um, Viva um, HBs. We've got the lot here. Pretty much we've got every colour. So I think the club was hoping to get about 60 cars down here today. And cars are still arriving. So let's hope they manage to make it. Some really superb examples. And, you know, it's, it's so long since I've seen some of these cars on the road. Even back in the day when I was growing up, they were becoming pretty rare then. This is a very lovely yellow twin cam logoed one there. We might have a trying to chat with the owner about that one in a second. It looks lovely. So here's one car that's never going to appear in any Vauxhall catalogue on eBay. It's a Lotus Viva. So we're going to have a chat with the owner Dick in a second about it and get him to tell us a bit more about it because uh, I sure don't know much about uh, this car. <laughs> right. So tell us about this fantastic Lotus Viva or Viva Lotus, whichever you prefer. Well, I call it the Lotus Viva and um, it's basically my own creation. It's a car that should have been, um, but it never actually was brought into production. So I thought I'd make my own. The basic thing is that the Lotus engine, however much they want to deny it, is based on the Vauxhall engine. Yes. And it fits in with a little alteration to the sump um, on exactly the same engine mountings and wearing the exactly the same Vauxhall gearbox. So there isn't uh, any reason why they shouldn't have made one, except I do believe there was a certain amount of political to and fro in at the higher end of Vauxhall between them and Lotus. Oh wow. <laughs> what sort of power is this putting out there? It's right now, it's tuned a bit and it's uh, Mm, I'd like to say 200, but it's probably about 185. 185, and the car probably weighs what, about a ton or maybe? Oh, it's about 1200 kilos. About 1200 kilos, all that heavy, yeah. right? Oh, fantastic. I do a little bit of drag racing on 1 8 mile. Uh, it's got a manualized automatic gearbox so I can launch very well. And uh, I'll have a lot of fun with it. I'll bring it to places like this. And we've just put in a 180 miles drive round to get here because we had to go somewhere else before we came here. Fantastic. And we stayed overnight. So, yes, it's uh, a street um, car that's street and track, really. Fantastic. Thank you for talking to us about it. Okay. So this is the Calibre you probably never heard of. Based on the 130 SRI Cavalier Mark II, built in a cooperation with uh, Ermshire, and Aston Martin Tickford, believe it or not, it is a Vauxhall Cavalier Calibre. It's a 2 litre 8 valve overhead engine, just a standard 130 horsepower. Just 500 were produced of these. In fact, I do remember them. I worked for a company that back in the day actually gave one of these as a, as a prize to uh, uh, the best performing uh, branch. And they could run the car, I think, for a week or so, and uh, they'd be given it by Vauxhall. Absolutely fantastic. You will not probably see another one of these. Uh, they've got those lovely sort of um, bottle top type alloy wheels. And as I say, the, uh, the modifications were really limited to um, changes with the bodywork. But doesn't it look good? I do like those. So one Cavalier that does tend to survive rather well are these convertible cars. This is one of them. I do see more of the convertibles than probably any of the others. They do survive really rather well. So I think launched in 88, 89, this is one of the early F-plated Mark III Cavaliers. This one's the one that everybody wanted at the time. It's the SRI, the sporty version, lovely in this gunmetal grey metallic it's the one we all wanted it's the five door as well so really uh, handy and uh, it's in beautiful condition as well isn't it 
So built by Lotus on behalf of GM Group is this Vauxhall VX220, I think it's called Speedster. It was also sold as an Opel Speedster and in fact even as a Deu Speedster, although I've never seen one of those I must confess. Um, this particular car is in this lovely day glow orange. Apparently the, uh, the parts that could be exchanged with the standard Elise are minimal but it was built on the same lines and it was built in the same factory. So I'll leave it to your uh, judgment as to whether you think the uh, parts um, could be exchanged between the cars, but it's lovely, isn't it? There's, um, one of these cars is, has just been rebuilt on the Cash Machine Cars channel, so check out how he's rebuilt one of these uh, in his shed and made a pretty good job of it, but what a great car. So this is a 1990 uh, Vauxhall Carlton GSI 3000. Now these cars are interesting that this one has the interior that was taken from the Lotus Carlton. The owner I think has the original interior as well. We're just going to try and have a look at it from the back. Now this was the basis from which the Lotus Carlton was actually adapted. So these were sent to the Lotus factory at Hethel and basically adapted and turned into uh, a Lotus Carlton and we'll try and have a look at one of those later. It's a lovely car isn't it for you know sort of uh, over 30 years of age. I bet it goes a bit with a 3 litre 24 valve engine in there. It certainly won't be sure to power will it? We've got a bit of double Bedford going on here. We've got a Bedford transporter, Bedford CF, yeah CF, facelifted CF transporter and on the back of it We've got a Bedford Rascal, but not just a Bedford Rascal, a Bedford Rascal motorhome. I'm not sure what sort of holiday you could have in a motorhome that little. You'd certainly have to be on uh, good terms with, uh, with your travelling partners, wouldn't you? And it's a Bedford Rascal Roma home. There you go, eh? Double Vauxhall goodness there. So I'm with a gentleman who calls himself Bedford Bill for obvious reasons, because... He's going to talk to us about this double Bedford, a CF and a Bedford yeah, Rascal. Yeah. That's just, Bill, that's just plain greedy, isn't it? It is, it is. I've got, I've got a few of them, I must admit, though, so I'm... Right. So, but, uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is a, it's a Bedford CF2P, uh, which has been extended before I bought it to be this long, because obviously it shouldn't be quite that long. And uh, I use it to pick up these sort of things, so they're Bedford... Oh, so it's in use every day, as it? A, is. As a... Yeah, it is. This, this is actually, I'm just picking this one up from somebody in Birmingham down, to take it down south, because I'm, I'm based down in Sussex, so... Okay. So, yeah. So after the Cadillac sort of Chevrolet lines of the PA uh, Velox Stroke Cresta, this is a PB version, so you can see the influence of the FB Victor in this car looks very similar. Looks like a bigger Victor from some angles, doesn't it? Obviously, I think it's got the six-cylinder engine in there. You know, by the time this car came, the, the, the styling uh, styling had changed, and we moved on quite a bit. That central ringed horn, love that strip speedo. It's got there some lovely, lovely styling features with this car. But again, you know, you take a closer look, you can really see this is. Uh, a step change from the PA cars and uh, still got some sort of semi-American elements to it, hasn't it, in terms of the styling. That's a great car, it's in lovely condition I must admit. Following on from the success of the Manta, I didn't think that the Calibra had been actually competitively rallied, but Benny Melander and Stig Bonkloos, yeah these Stig Bonkloos, have actually rallied these cars. I think uh, it's got to be a relatively rare car. Next to it is the Manta that we all associate it with rallying. It's got the, uh, what, 16 valve double overhead cam uh, engine. I guess uh, it's probably turbocharged. I'm not sure about that as a, as a rally. It's got those fantastic OZ racing uh, stroke rallying wheels. It's had some action at the Goodwood Festival of Speed looking at it. That's great. I didn't know they uh, they rallied these. Fantastic. Now here's a one owner, Brochard Yellow. Yeah, apparently that's the colour. Uh, Tigra 1.4 automatic. Now these pretty much had the coupe market to themselves until the Puma arrived with Ford, which uh, certainly increased the competition quite a bit. The owner of this car bought it for £250 and he's resurrected it 
and it looks in absolutely stunning condition. I think I've seen this car maybe a, a couple of years ago at an event up in Yorkshire. In fact, I'm sure I have. What a lovely car. And you're not going to see too many Tigras here. Surprising for the numbers sold, they are relatively rare. So sharing the same platform of the Chevette, and you can see obviously it's, it's very clearly uh, related to the Chevette, is this Opel Cadet. Looks like this one might have had a bit of an engine transplant in there. That certainly doesn't look like the original block. Um, great to see this here today. And I'm not sure if these were sold. I think somebody said to me on a previous video they were sold in Ireland as Opals. So no event will be complete without a Vauxhall Nova. These are the predecessor to the course. So the three door ones are particularly prized simply because of these blistered arches that the five door didn't have. It couldn't be engineered in five door. This one's a 1.6 injection. I've yet to see if there's an SR here today. I'd love to see one of those. But these are super, super prized car really were the ones to have are the ones to have in fact it's the gte so yes it is the one to have another vehicle coming out of the relationship between gm Vauxhall, and isuzu is this bedford midivan this one's got a high roof um, you can see obviously the styling does indicate that it's one of these far eastern commercial vehicles and sat above the rascal as a sort of sub transit size vehicle i would suggest now the fact this Carlton is badge Lotus gives it all away. It's one of the Lotus Carltons. Um, these were taken, as I probably mentioned elsewhere in the video, from a base GSI 3000 Carlton and then converted. Each one was converted and sold, I think, in this Imperial uh, Green at Lotus's factory in Hethel. Limited production run of vehicles sold as Opals and Vauxhalls. It uh, is the only car that questions in Parliament were asked about it because there was one of these uh, 40 RA registration number that was used on a series of daring uh, ram raids and robberies and the police could never catch it back in the day. So I'm not sure where that car is now, but uh, this is still a pretty, pretty quick car. Now, although this is a Mark 1 Astra shape, it's actually where this particular car is badged as an Opal but you can see the big differences at the back that's why i've started off at the back it's not a hatchback as you'll have seen on um, morsels and motors channel as he's bought one of these a yellow one it's actually a boot the base cars came fitted in explicitly with a boot so they had two different body types i figure that one out the engineering cost of doing that must have been terrific this is a lovely car i'm not sure what this color's called uh, i seem to think it's china blue or something like this great to see one here today and next we've got the one that probably everybody aspired to a mark one astra gte isn't that fantastic a couple of these for sale at anglia car auctions at the moment and uh it's, it's pretty rare you're going to see these and then obviously a more modern astra next to it so this is a car i've been waiting to see it's a Vauxhall pa Velox. So the Cresta was the upmarket version of this. This itself replaced the Wyvern model, Wyvern being a mythical creature akin to a Griffin. And in actual fact, it's got some lovely features. Look at the wrap round windscreen and how far that door cuts in to the passenger compartment there. Lovely Baker light steering wheel, some lovely features there. Look at the handles there, how the handles glide into that strip. This is pure. 19, late 1950s Americana, isn't it? You know what? That's absolutely one of my favourite cars of the show. So I'm with Pete, who's going to tell me about this fantastic uh, Chevette. It's it's clearly not a standard car. I saw that it's got the, uh, and I'll drop in the footage of the conversion to the lights. It looks like it's got a Lotus engine in. What's going on? It is a Lotus engine, uh, engine and gearbox from a Lotus XL. Oh wow, so that's what, about 180 brake or something like that? Listed or? at 185, but whether that's true or not, I don't know. Wow, and have you done this conversion yourself? or? Yes. yeah, done all the work. And, and how long did it take you to do that? Seven years. And it looks like you've made some change. It doesn't like a standard dashboard. You've, have you, you've sort of covered it with something. It looks lovely. I'll actually flocked. drop in. It's a flock finish. I'll, I'll drop some pictures of that in as well. And what sort of performance do you get out of it? This must be drag strip type territory, is it? It's quick. 
dealership. I'm a bit surprised a few people at the lights when a, a Chevette pulls up. What, what year is this Chevette? 1980. A 1980 Chevette pulls up and gives uh, gives some of our uh, some of our guys a fright in this, yeah? Can do. Excellent. And have you come find it today? or? Bruce and Edmunds. Oh, wow, you've had a quite a trip in it. Well, yeah, two hours or two and a half hours. I don't mind driving. It's a nice car to drive. Well, 180 year brake horsepower. You won't be hanging about there, though, I can imagine. Keep it legal. Excellent. Oh, thanks for talking to us about it. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So never officially sold in the UK, but sold in left-hand drive markets and a lot in the US is this Opel GT. Now, the standout point for me, as I've seen at the Practical Classic show last year with one of the guys, is the, the lights don't so much pop up, they actually rotate. It's a pity nobody can show us that one today. This is resplendent in orange. Look at those small, tiny wheels that we, we became used to. Got some lovely, lovely touches on this car. It's in super condition. And this particular one is unusual in that it's actually an automatic. And I don't think I've seen an automatic one yet. So by the time this was produced, this Vauxhall Astro van by this stage, the Bedford name had been dropped by Vauxhall, I think in the early part of the 90s. This particular vehicle based on the Astra Mark III, um, it's got this fateful British gas signage, uh, livery. I'm not sure if it's an original British gas vehicle or not, um, but it's, if it isn't, it's a very faithful recreation. I'm massively impressed by this one. The, I can't get across to you the condition of this van. It is immense. It's as well prepared as many of the cars here. Wow. So along with this Vauxhall Astra van, British gas liveried, there are plenty more vehicles to see. We've just scratched the surface, so keep watching. I've got quite a bit of the show left to cover. It's actually starting to get a bit warmer now, which I'm thankful for. So stick with us and uh, keep watching. So the Victor name continued in Vauxhall's lineup right until the launch of the Carlton, believe it or not. Uh, this is an F-Series uh, Victor, absolutely superb condition. Um, you can see here this, as you would expect of Vauxhalls of this period, the influence of the American styling, um, absolutely like a mini American car of the period. It's got those um, uh, side, really side mounted indicators or side running lights on a pod. Um, if we take a walk down the back of the car, we can see it's not quite got full on fins, but you can certainly see the influence car. These F type Victors, I've seen just a handful of these. Uh, they sadly had issues with rot, as many cars did of the period, so it's great to see that one here today. This is probably one of the latest Mark III Vauxhall Cavaliers that you're going to see. It's a facelifted car, but look at the registration number. It was registered one year after the Vector had been introduced. It's a GLS, but unusually, it's uh, got the GLS trim, but it's actually a 2.5 litre car, making it super unusual. I've never seen another one that's been registered on a P plate. By this time, the Vector was... Um, was on sale as their, as their main model in this market. So when colour coding everything in uh, body colour, in white in this case, was a thing, this was the rage. So it's a, a late Astra Mark II. Um, very aerodynamic design. This one's a very desirable 16 valve GTE. We're gonna take a walk down there because we can see um, its successor. It had a tough act to follow and this is the um, replacement so you can see this is a cd version seldom seen and seldom in this condition it's a 93 on a k you know again i say this maybe too often these days commonplace but then you never see them anymore on the roads lovely to see i think it's got the original wheels on cd was quite a high trim level um probably has air condition i would imagine And shout out to the East Yorkshire Thoroughbred Classic Car Club because I think it's one of their car members. So this is one of the super aerodynamic Astras uh, that was launched, I think, in the mid 80s. Uh, these used pretty much Mark I mechanicals beneath them, but that super, super slippery body made them pretty quick. This is the SRI. As you can see, it's got the lovely, I'm not sure if you can see that tartan interior, 
Well, it's a pleasure to see one of these here today. These actually, as I recall, these drove really, really well. I mean, even as 1.3s, these were quick cars relative to the day. Super. So this was Vauxhall's, Vauxhall and Opel's last big car. This was the Amiga. Um, by that stage, pretty much the volume manufacturers were giving up on that segment and leaving it to the premium, uh, premium manufacturers to take over with the 5 Series and the E-Class. This is how sports some Irmshire modifications. That's unusual to see one of these in red as well, isn't it? So this is the Vauxhall VXR. In fact, it's a Holden. In fact, this one still sports the Holden badges. As you can see, they're sold under the Vauxhall brand in the UK. And now Holden doesn't even exist anymore. GM closed that brand in Australia. Great to see that uh, muscle car here. Now, I don't think uh, you have the same soft spot I do for these, but this is a Vauxhall Carlton. My dad had the diesel version of this back in the day. Uh, this is a B-plated, so what, probably what, 84, 85. Um, by this time, the unique droop snoot style in the, the original Carlton had gone, and pretty much the car looks similar to the Opel variant in, uh, Opel Record variant in, uh, in Europe. Great to see those here today. Again, not in huge numbers anymore. And next to it, we've got the Senator beloved of police forces a three litre um, 24 valve senator you know you've got real comfort with that car and um, again another relatively uh, rare one these days isn't it I say that quite often but it's but it's perfectly true so hands up who remembers the Vauxhall Frontera based on an Isuzu design and actually built in the UK at the plant in Luton uh, was the Frontera had a, a relatively um, reasonable life suffered with a few quality problems at the beginning but um, before they turned over to van production I think this probably was the last passenger vehicle they produced although I'll put that in the comments if I've got that wrong Vauxhall fans although this one's badged SR I'm not sure it's a full SR I think it's just the grill but you know why put it in there well i like novas so forgive me uh, that indulgence those blistered wheel arches this one's in a lower trim level next to it we've got a higher trim level and we've got a gsi next to it so there you are Vauxhall nova fans hopefully that made you happy now elsewhere in the video you'll have seen an f-type uh, victor but this is an f-type victor estates now estates of this period were often the preserve of specialist coach builders Farnham and, and Crayford and others who uh, dabbled in these. So let's have a look. So built to celebrate touring car success with the Treble 8 team is this Treble 8 uh, Vauxhall Astra Coupe. There's actually one of these in the museum you can take a look at as well. Built in relatively small numbers as well. I'll try and put some details on the screen about the power output of that one. I think it's certainly 200 brake horsepower plus. Now, if there's a good reason not to have too many energy drinks, this might be it. This is a monster from every sense of the word. Yeah, it looks like an Astra, but it's really, really going for it. Certainly in terms of that livery, the bonnet and those struts. Not quite sure what it's hiding underneath there. Even the uh, engine cover says monster on it as well what a car let's have a quick look at the back from that one it's getting a lot of attention a lot of photographs here that green that lime green over black seems to work really well doesn't it so this was Vauxhall's first real stab at the fleet market with the Cavalier this is the Mark 1 Cavalier the one that started it all um, based on the Ascona platform with that droop snoot front adder to the vehicle. This one's in lovely condition. There's one of these in the museum as well. And obviously on the basis of the success of this car, they then launched the um, Mark II, which was incredibly successful as a, as a car in the fleet market. So this is a droop snoot estate or fastback. Actually, there was 197 built this one was rediscovered by an ex-apprentice at Ellesmere Port and who recommissioned the vehicle. So it's not homemade. It actually was an officially built vehicle that went into some limited production.
So I'm here with Mick, who's going to tell us about this Manta Berlinetta that we saw a little bit earlier. I'll uh, cut in some pictures from around the car. It's got this lovely velour interior. Mick, how long have you had this car? I've had this one about two years. Wow. Um, it's been a club car for quite a while. Um, this is the only one left registered on the road as a chrome bumper automatic. Because they were sold as Vauxhall sports hatches, weren't yes, they? Yes, that was but, the English version. But yeah. they, oh, this was, is this a, an Irish car then? Or? No, no, this is a, this is an English car sold through Opel. Okay. Opel, um, but obviously the, the Vauxhall sold the sports hatch right. and Opel sold the Manta. Ah, okay. So, yeah, um, these were very popular back in the day, but um, this is the only surviving chrome bumpered one registered on the road. Wow, that's fantastic. So, um, I'm totally original. Um, never been touched well, apart from the radio and bits and pieces but it's got know. what 71,000 miles that's all from you yeah, yep it's all genuine and, and what year is this this is a 1978 78 wow where were we in 1978 guys that was, uh, yeah it takes younger, me back younger fitter <laughs> exactly yeah that's right I, <laughs> yes. yeah I probably have more money then <laughs> yes Bye. So back in January 1983, 4,893 pounds would have bought you this Mark I Astra GL, owned by a father, uh, then a son with a next door neighbor in between. It's in this silver green metallic, it's a GL specification model. The only extra this car has been fitted with is the metallic paint, which was at extra cost. What a stunning car that one is, the condition of that one. I'm not hoping it comes across on camera is absolutely immense isn't it so this is a one of one quicksilver design exercise Astra based on the GTE we're gonna have a chat with the owner shortly but let's... so Colin's gonna tell me about this car now I had a quick look at the outside and it looked like it started silver and it's great at the back and I read it's a design study but how come you've got this and it's not in a museum it was in Vauxhall's uh, heritage collection right um, for a while it's to celebrate the 25th anniversary of Ellesmere Port the silver anniversary of Ellesmere Port wow. factory in 87 this is quite a special car then isn't it in terms yeah. of part of uh, the history of Ellesmere Port because Ellesmere Port's just moved over to I think making um, electric vans hasn't it there's uh, and they got rid of, they sold it in 88 to a dealer in North Shields, a Vauxhall dealer who used it <laughs> to attract people into the showroom. Um, yeah, I think I think they went bust, I'm not sure. And it went through, through owner to owner and eventually it went to uh, on eBay three times. It was went to a, a, a sales, a dealer bought it, put an MOT on it, couldn't sell it so it went back on eBay and I bought it. Wow. I saw it at 87 Motor Show actually, I knew what it was. Wow, you saw it when it was new at the 87 Motor Show. That's an incredible story. And, and the fact it is a one-off, there is no other one, is there? There's no other one. This is the only one. So the interior, I'll cut in some shots here into the video of what the interior looks like. Because if you've seen the exterior, you, you think that's impressive. The interior is, is, is immense. So we'll cut some of those shots in. So uh, you've done a lot of work to the car. It was pretty much like this. It's or? pretty much standard like this. All I did was make sure it was roadworthy and usable. Wow. It looks like it's just come straight out of the uh, heritage collection somewhere. So it's, it's, it's now done six thousand, just over six thousand miles. Six thousand miles from you. Wow! <laughs> it's just run in. And what's it? So it's a normal what, a sixteen valve GTE. No, it's only a normal one point eight GTE. Okay, okay. So it's eighty, it's eighty six, it's an eighty six car, but it's eighty eight registered. So they built it in. They took it off of the production line in eighty six, ripped it apart, and produced this car, and then. Put it to the and kept it to Ellesmere Port for '87 and used it for '87 Motor Show. Fantastic! What a great store! What a great car! I mean, we talk about cars that are one-offs, but but you you have got one of one. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's nobody wanted it. Even even got hand-stitched uh, Connolly leather sun visors and things like that. It's all done in Connolly. Weighing just 925 kilos, but with 105 brake horsepower, this um, Viva HB GT really goes a bit. I love that contrasting black bonnet the spot lamps and the stripes this really was a, I guess what a mark 2 escort beater to some extent great color isn't it what a stunner apparently with uh, mini light wheels and an Isuzu color this lovely Viva HB is celebrating the 60th anniversary of the Viva nameplate. That looks amazing, doesn't it? So 
So thanks again for joining me on Lot 76 Cars at the first inaugural Vauxhall show at the British Motor Museum at Gaydon. Uh, if you like what you've seen, please like, share, subscribe, turn on notifications to get early advance notice of when my videos are out. And uh, once again, thanks for watching.